Uh, well, uh, we, we were down spending a lot of time on the beach, and uh, you can't uh, you can't help but notice when you're you're down uh, anywhere along the shoreline uh, to see one of these. Um, there there were there were just uh, these crazy seagulls, and uh, you know you just you couldn't escape them. Uh, you know they were they were you know hanging around the umbrellas. They were you know diving into the water. Uh, they were grubbing around looking for French fries. Uh, there was a uh, a guy. It was uh, it was I think it was Thursday night. Or Friday night. It was toward the end of our stay. Uh, There's this dude. He was down here surf fishing, and um, he had this bucket of bait. And uh, he was out there, and he was casting out in the surf. It was late in the afternoon, and. Uh, he, said, he catches something, and you can see he is fighting this, this monster of whatever. You couldn't see it. It was way out there in the water. Uh, and he's, he's, he's struggling, you know, trying to reel in this, this fish. Turns out he caught a stingray. Uh, it was literally, it was, it was like this big, it was enormous. It took him 20 minutes to land this thing. Well, while this guy is fighting this stingray, the seagulls picked up on the fact that he can't guard his bait bucket, and they started hanging out, you know, go, getting into the bucket. And, uh, I mean, they're, 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 they're kind of gross. Um, you know they'll, they'll eat anything. You, you'll see them, you know, under cars and doing all sorts of, you know, you know, nastiness. And um, but there's a lot. You know, you, in fact, in the Bible it tells us that seagulls, um, you uh, you can't eat them. Uh, they're forbidden as uh, food in the Old Testament. They're considered unclean birds. And, and I can understand why after spending a week looking at these crazy things. Um, but what I found unusual is that there's a lot in common with seagulls in today's message. And uh, in fact, we're going to learn a little bit from seagulls. And uh, one of the things that I was contemplating when it comes to these, these crazy birds is where do they go when a storm comes? You know, we had, it was Wednesday night and we were hanging out and uh, all of a sudden, you know, when, when you're on the ocean, you know, sometimes there's, there's, you know, these violent storms that come pounding in. And uh, we had one of those storms hit on, uh, on Wednesday evening. And what was unique was I was asking myself, where do these seagulls go? What do they do like when a hurricane comes? Because they don't have nests like other birds. You know, a lot of times you'll see these birds, they'll, they'll be under ledges and under bridges and, you know, they have these little places of refuge, but not seagulls. Uh, so I decided to, to research into these, uh, these crazy gawky birds and uh, found that they understand uh, a thing or two about storms and a thing or two about life. So we, we have a few illustrations I'm going to share with you this morning uh, from seagulls. But the, the question that I was, I was going to pose is, what about us in storms? You know, where do we go when the storms strike? And that's something that most of us are, are in the midst of at times in our lives. We have these different storms we face. Many of them are relational. We have a hard time with people. And we have a tendency to clash. We have a tendency to you know, get in trouble. We have a tendency to not get along. And uh, there's, there's a lot of relational storms that we face. And Paul addresses this. Uh, and so do the seagulls. So we're going to look at some scripture. We're going to look at the gulls as well this morning. Uh, but uh, Colossians chapter 3, verses... Um, 12 and 13 says this, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And we'll stop right there because there's just so much in these two verses. Uh, we really have three things to look at here. We have our position in Christ that Paul opens with. Uh, we have our manifestation of Christ, how Jesus is going to uh, emulate from us. And then we finally have our application through Christ. Uh, so he opens here with this, this notion of our position in Christ. Uh, very important for us to understand, where do we stand with God? And, and I want to go right back to our, uh, our reading this morning, just a couple of verses in Ephesians. It says, just as he has chosen uh, in him, be, uh, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. And he says, we were predestined uh, us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ himself, according to the kind intention of his will. And what Paul is bringing up here in these two verses as we splice them together is really three essential things we have to understand about our relationship with God. Number one, that we've been chosen. Number two, that we are called to be holy. And number three, that all of God's decisions regarding you and me are driven by unconditional love. He says here that we are chosen, we are predestined, we are elected. You know, a person cannot just come to God on his or her own. 
He needs to initiate the process. He needs to start the ball rolling. He needs to convict us and convince us of our need of God. Because the Bible is clear that no one seeks after God, not one. Not one of us on our own, if we were left to our own devices, would have a heart to worship, would have a heart to praise, would have a heart to seek after Him, would have a desire to know Him and even grow in Him. None of us on our own would have that. Why? Because we're depraved. Because we're alienated. Because we're separated due to our sin. And God initiated the process. He's chosen us. He's destined us. He's called us. He's elected us. And this is important for us to understand that He is the one that initiates and completes the relationship that we have with Himself. Number two, He set us aside to be holy. And what that means is for a sacred purpose, something special, something unique, that we're to be righteous, that we're to be pure, that we are to have thoughts that are focused upon Him, that we're not to be entrenched and ensnared by evil desires in the ways of the world. Uh, and this is the, the desire of God for all of us. Uh, and in this world, it's a rare thing. <laughs> because basically everybody wants to do what they want to do and want, nobody wants to be uh, uh, under somebody else's is jurisdiction, especially God's. Uh, we live in a world that very much wants to just live by uh, its own or under its own control uh, instead of allowing Jesus to be Lord. So what we find here is that we're called to be chosen, we're chosen people, we're a holy people, and also everything that drives God is His love. Uh, he is not looking to manipulate people, He's not looking uh, to do anything unusual here, but He has unconditional love for you and for me. And what that really translates to is very simply this, on your worst day, in your darkest hour, when you have run as far away from God as you think you could possibly run, His love for you has not changed from your best day. That's agape love. That's unmerited love. We don't live in a relationship with God where we trade things back and forth. We don't come to the table and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to give you this and you're going to give me that. We don't come into worship on a Sunday morning and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to give you an hour of my life. I want you to fill my bank account. We don't come to God in prayer and say, okay, Lord, I'm going to pray and submit to you, but I want you to bless my marriage and make me fruitful or make my business prosperous. We don't trade with God. It's never driven like that. God has provided all that we could possibly need. He has provided us with His Son. He has provided us with life. He has provided us with our basic needs being met on so many different levels, relational, emotional, spiritual, psychological. And what He wants for us is in return to worship Him, to honor Him and to glorify Him. And it's not driven by a, a barter system, it's not driven by fear, but it is fueled by love. There was a guy when I, when I was in high school, I knew, he, he came from a town nearby, and he, came, he, he was one of these people that was just dealt a bad hand in life. Um, he came from a, a very uh, rough house or home. Uh, his, his father was a drunk. Uh, his mother was never around. Uh, he basically was raising his younger siblings. Uh, and this, this guy, he was just, he, he didn't have much going for him in terms of, you know, academics. You know, he, he was a C student when he tried his hardest. Uh, he wasn't good in sports, uh, didn't have a charismatic personality, uh, didn't have much of anything going on. And uh, he just struggled. You know, you get to see it all the time. He's always struggling because his dad was always out wasting all the money on, on, on alcohol. Uh, mom was never home. Uh, and, and he was just terribly neglected. And, and you could see that. And, and he just kind of limped along through life. Uh, didn't have a lot of friends. And, and there was a guy in that town who was, um, I'm not going to say he was rich, but, but he, was, he was doing pretty well. You know, I'm going to say well off. Uh, he was an electrician. And uh, he had this business, and his business was prospering, and it was doing quite well. He had lots of contracts. And this electrician uh, took note of this kid and offered him an apprenticeship. Not because he had done anything great, not because he showed any sort of fantastic potential, but, but this, this electrician in, in town, he, he, he went up to this guy, his name was Tom. He said, Tom, you know, I'm, you know, I'm going to give you an opportunity if you want to take it. And that is, I'll, I'll take you in. And I'll teach you how to become an electrician. And I'll show you all the skills that you need, and I'll, and I'll, and I'll pay you. Uh, and you can work with me, and I will, I will I'll prepare you with a trade so that when you get out of high school, uh, you could springboard into, into a job. He was chosen. He was given an opportunity to do something with purpose. And, he was, and this, this came out of the kindness of this neighbor's heart. 
Not because Tom had done anything remarkable or outstanding or anything to even earn that. And that guy Tom worked his tail off. Why? Because he was, he was given an opportunity. He was shown unconditional love. And he, be, he went on to become a master electrician. He did remarkably well. Why? Because this fella displayed grace to my buddy Tom. This is what we find here. Our relationship with God impacts our relationship with others. Just as this fella had this opportunity, he was elected, he was called, he was given this unique moment to, to become uh, you know, an apprentice and ultimately an electrician. We've been called to be representatives of the king. We have been elected to serve the living God. We have been given grace upon grace. We have been shown love immeasurable. And in light of that truth or those truths, we now respond back to him and that's how we impact other people. Your relationship with God is going to be directly reflected upon how you interact with the people around you. That's why I write here, our relationship with God impacts our relationship with others. Point number one, our position in Christ. Number two, we have the manifestation of Christ, the byproduct. How does this relationship sprout out and produce things in our lives? Paul has two things he's mentioning here in the passage, attitude and action. He described the internal change, what happens within the heart and the soul. And he mentions five things, that when Jesus takes root in somebody's heart, when we come to him, when we're born again, when we trust in Christ for our salvation, number one, compassion is produced. Compassion. That is the ability to have mercy, and to relate to other people, to feel their pain, to understand what somebody else is going through. Why do you think Jesus walked the earth? Why do you think he interacted with people that were of low esteem? Why do you think he was willing to stoop down and connect with the poor and the lame and the blind and those who are struggling? He displayed compassion. That's what it looks like. It's that ability to relate to somebody else's pain. We see that very often when we go through pain ourselves. If you've been in the military, if you've been a soldier, if you've served on the front lines, there's a unique relationship between you and your fellow soldiers. Why? Because you understand what it's like to face the fears and the struggles and the hardship of battle. If you've gone through a catastrophic illness, if you have gone through cancer or some other major physical ailment, you understand what it's like when you hear somebody across the aisle or across the town or across the, the table say to you, hey, I, just got, I was just diagnosed the other day. You have compassion. Why? Because you understand what that pain feels like. And one of the reasons why we go through hardships in, in life is because it, com, it, it cultivates that sense of compassion. It also says we're to be kind. A kind person is someone who is useful who was helpful. It's not, oh yeah, you know, have a good day and God bless you and all that. No, no, no. You, you, you get down and you get practical. Kindness is pragmatic. It's, it's this notion here that I'm going to get involved with somebody else's life. I'm going to open up the door. I'm going to make the meal. I'm going to show up for the visit. I'm going to, I'm going to help ease the burden. That's what a kind person does. We also find here humility. Uh, that's something that we don't see much today. Uh, you, you look around and everybody likes to boast about all the stuff they have and all the stuff they've done and all the places they've been. Uh, a humble person is very low. A humble person understands they need Jesus. A humble person understands that they can't do things themselves. A humble person is willing to say, it's okay to help. You know, it's one thing to give help. And many of us are quick to do that. But how hard is it for us to receive help? That's your humility gauge right there. When somebody offers to help you, how willing are you to accept that help? I'll be the first to admit, I struggle with it. I really do. You know, I was raised in a very independent home. I was raised to be responsible, raised to go out and do my stuff, raised to go out there and, and just you know, contribute. But to receive help, that's a little different. And this is something we're called to be willing to accept. Humility. Reliance upon God and reliance upon how God's going to work through other people around us. He also mentions here gentleness. That's to be meek, to be reserved. Um, and uh, what we find here is that, uh, you know, in our, in our culture, what do people do? They, they like to boast about themselves and all their accomplishments and things that they do. Uh, gentleness is just the opposite. Uh, we also find here that we're called to be patient. Uh, and that's to have a slow fuse. 
is not to get angry quickly, um, to persevere, long suffering. Uh, I was down, you know, driving in New Jersey this past week. Uh, there's not a lot of long suffering on the highways down there. Uh, I cannot tell you the number of times I got cut off uh, or the number of times that somebody would be, I mean, I was literally in a parking lot. Uh, I, I, we, I was looking for, for some stuff. Uh, I had to stop into a craft store. I need to get a, a sheet of plastic. And uh, I'm in this parking lot. It's, it's Friday morning. It's about 9 o'clock in the morning. The entire parking lot is empty, okay? There's like three cars close to the front door. I'm one of these people. I never park near anybody. You know, I've had enough shopping carts pushed into my car, and I've had enough people bump into my bumper. So I always park in remote areas. Uh, I, I, I do when I go to everywhere. I just, I just park out there in the boonies and I'll hike you know four miles to a grocery store because I don't want somebody you know whacking into my car well I do that I park way out in the middle of this lot I go into the store I ask around they didn't have what I was looking for I'm at my car way out in the middle of nowhere and I just opened the door and I was looking if I had my, my, my cell phone out and I'm looking on my GPS for this other store I was going to try to find the item in and I'm, and I'm there with the door open and I'm, and I'm plugging stuff in before I, I take a seat because I had good cell service in the lot and all of a sudden somebody's honking their horn at me. I'm like what are you doing? This dude is behind me honking his horn. He's got 57 different places to park his truck and he's giving me grief because of my door is open and he's got 28 feet to my right and 28 feet to the left and he wants to pull right in and almost takes my door off and I'm like that is not long suffering <laughs> that's not patience and, and then of course he takes up four spots when he parks his truck uh, and, and at that moment I'm thinking to myself all right Jersey attitude Grace, Jersey had to do great. You know, I'm back and forth, and, and, and you'll be happy to know, and I'll report back to you that I, 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 I just, I quietly prayed for him. I closed my door and I left the scene, uh, and I didn't make a scene, uh, which was, a, which was a major victory for me. Uh, so, uh, so this is what we're talking about here in terms of patience and long suffering. This is the attitude we have to have. This is the internal that enables us. Uh, to, to live out the life that God wants us to live in relation to one another. And the action here, uh, this attitude is going to produce two things, it tells us in the passage. Number one, a sense of, of, of bearing with one another. Uh, or, or putting up with one another. Uh, depending on what translation you, you read here, uh, this, this notion here in, in Colossians is that we are, we are called uh, to hold one another up. Uh, to be willing uh, to, to persist with each other. And, uh, and this is what we find here in, uh, in, in Romans. It says, you know, to bear with one another in love. And uh, I, I think one of the best pictures of bearing with each other when we're going through tough times, when it comes to those relational storms, uh, you know, when, when you're down on the beach and, and you see these young families and uh, you, you have the mom and the dad going down there and, and somebody's pushing like this giant cart through the sand and you got a couple kids on the back and one under an arm and another on the head and they got umbrellas and, and you know coolers and all this other stuff and, and they're, they're, they're carrying this load as they're trying to get through the sand to go down there so their kids could play in this giant sandbox for a couple hours and, and I see that picture all the time of these parents juggling you know 27 different kids and they're they're dragging them along and they're doing their thing uh, and they're carrying all this extra weight and, and that's a picture really of what we find here in Romans of bearing with one another that's how we're to be treating each other. You need to bear with me. I need to bear with you. I mean, I've got my issues. I've got my quirks, my idiosyncrasies. I've got my sinful problems. That's not that we're going to tolerate one another's sin and turn around and say, yeah, you know, it's okay. We don't condone the sin. But every one of us in this room, we have our struggles. Some of you are morning people. Some of you are night people. Some of you are neither. <laughs> Some of you have different tastes in music. Some of you like different types of foods. Some of you have different struggles. Some of you in this room are type A personality. You like everything laid out and organized. You have your lists and then other lists. You have your schedule, your calendar, all your stuff. And others, you can't even find your calendar. You, because you lost under a stack of stuff. And you don't really care about it. And, and we, we wrestle with this. Every one of us in this room, we're, we're all wired a little differently. 
And we're like those, those parents out on the beach. We, we've got we've to bear with one another and realize that every one of us in this room is wired differently. We've got different struggles, and that's what we're called to do. It also tells us here that we're called to, to forgive one another. Um, it tells us here to forgive one another just as Christ has forgiven us. And that word of, of forgiveness is uh, charizmo. And I bring that up because it, the root is, is charisma. That's where we get the word charismatic from. Uh, we're, to, we're called to extend a, a free, unmerited gift. We're called to extend release. We're called to pardon. We're called to not count someone else's sins against them. When, when we talk about this idea of, of charizmo here, uh, it, is, it is very crucial for, for us to understand that this is how God has treated us. We need to learn to release the, the bitterness when we're hurt. We're called to release the anger when we're struggling. We're called to release the rancor and the hate, the animosity. We've got to let it go because that'll ruin us. It'll chew us up from the inside out. Part of forgiveness is letting go of that bitter root. It's also releasing the debt. You know, there's a parable in the New Testament of, of a very rich man who has a servant. The servant owns him a fortune. And the servant says, I can't possibly repay it. Have mercy on me. And the rich man does what? He forgives the debt. He lets it go. And that's precisely what we're called to do as well. To not seek vengeance. To not seek revenge. To not seek recompense. But to let it go. That doesn't mean we abandon the concept of justice. What it means is we leave justice in the hands of a just and holy God. That's where forgiveness comes into play. And all of this really stems from a deep root and a relationship with God. Which brings us to a picture here I wanted to share with you. When you're down on the beach, you see a lot of this. No matter where you go. Way up in Maine, all the way down. I, I've, I've, I've never been out to the Pacific, um, but at least on the Atlantic seaboard, uh, I've, I've seen like in Florida and South Carolina and Jersey and Virginia, and, uh, you see this is seagrass. And, and seagrass is kind of unique. It's all over the place. And, and what I find very unusual about this is, you know, you have this grass that's growing in the middle of sand. Now, I don't know about you, but there's not a lot of stuff that really grows well on sand, uh, but seagrass does. And what's unique about this, this plant that is all over the place uh, when you're down on, on the shoreline is its root system. For every foot or so you see of the seagrass above the surface, you've got at least one to maybe two feet of root going down. So you could have, there's certain types of seagrasses out there, maybe two, three feet high you'll see above the surface. They could have eight to nine feet of root system below the surface. What you, what you don't see enables what you do see to flourish. And that's a beautiful picture of our walk with God. What you don't see inside my heart and your heart, that relationship cultivating and growing, that compassion taking root, that humility becoming part of who we are, that sense of mercy and kindness taking root in our souls, that idea of having gentleness and patience, as we grow in that relationship internally, it will manifest itself externally in the fruit that people see. And this is why it is so important for us uh, to be rooted and grounded in Christ. Uh, and I, I wanted to share with you a passage from um, the, uh, the book of uh, Ephesians. It's Paul's prayer. And this is really why and how we could have better relationships in the middle of storms. Listen to what he says here in Paul's prayer, Ephesians 3, 16 through 18. And he prays this, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with power through his spirit in the inner man. Okay, this is the rooting here. This is the heart. This is the soul. This is the part that nobody sees. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith and that you being, here's that word, rooted and grounded in his love and his compassion and his mercy may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth of his love. And that, produ that leads us really to our second point, and that is a change in attitude produces a change in action. 
that internal attitude, that internal relationship, that internal rooting, that internal grounding, which we all need to develop through worship, through prayer, through Bible study, through understanding how he desires to have a relationship with you and me, that internal metamorphosis produces that fruit, that action of bearing and forgiving. Now let's take a look here at the application and we'll land this plane this morning. Number three, application through Christ. How does this all come to pass? Because Jesus forgave us first. It starts with the gospel. It starts with Romans chapter 13, or chapter 3 rather, when it tells us this. But now apart from the law, a righteousness of God has been manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God through faith, in Jesus Christ for all those who believe for there's no distinction for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God being justified as a gift hang on to that that's the grace that we're talking about here a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus here we find my friends the fuel that propels us to want to apply that which we learn it is God's gracious gift of salvation his gift of Jesus Christ, his suffering on the cross. The passage, it tells us here that there should be no, no whining or complaining about things. Uh, it brings this up in, in, um, in the New American Standard uh, that we shouldn't be, be harboring these different grievances toward each other because that creates a sense of division. And what, what we find here is that it is easy when storms come, when we're facing pressure, when somebody starts gawking at you and giving you a hard time, when somebody starts disagreeing with you, when somebody starts stepping on your toes, when we end up bumping into one another, what, ends, what, what happens is, is that we have a tendency, the natural mind, the natural man, is going to turn around and start complaining. We're going to start whining. We're going to start getting resistant. And that brings us to something called seagull syndrome. You know that's an actual condition? There's a condition out there, it's called seagull syndrome. And it's when a person, a family member or friend, gawks at another person and criticizes them when they're taking care of a family member at home. It's an actual condition uh, that has been diagnosed here. It's when you find fault and you blame some other people uh, for doing a poor job, especially if you're taking care of somebody in your own home. Uh, it's this, this critical spirit. It's called the seagull syndrome. And we've got to watch out for that. Uh, just as those gulls are gawking around at each other and everything else around us, we have a tendency to gawk as well. And uh, we've got to be very, very careful about that because it doesn't produce the righteousness, the holiness that God desires when those storms come. Instead, we need to take a good hard look at the cross and stop and ask ourselves the question, how did Jesus respond when the storms came? How did Jesus react when he was accused? How did Jesus interface with those who hated him? How did Jesus take on the pain, the physical pain, the suffering, the rejection? What did Jesus do in the storms that he had to face, especially the final storm at the end of his life? He went through what? Bogus trials, false accusations, witnesses who rose up who couldn't even corroborate their testimony. He appeared before uh, Herod didn't even say a word and he was sent back, assumed guilty. They found absolutely no fault. In fact, Pilate even said it numerous times. I find no fault with this man. He's innocent. You know, and they still wanted him crucified. How did he handle that storm? How would we have handled that storm? Well, the seagulls do something unique. When storms come in, and this is something I, I, I never realized, when a storm comes in, a seagull, they, they, even though they're kind of kind of weird birds and uh, gawky and, uh, and and a little gross at times, they're also smart. A, a seagull, when a, when a major hurricane comes in, as that storm comes in, you, you notice they, they disappear because they use the storm to their advantage. As a storm moves in, there's a lot of currents, there's a lot of airflow, especially in the higher altitudes. And what the seagulls will do is they'll actually skirt and use the storm, and they skirt around the storm. They stay, they'll, be, they'll, they'll go maybe hundreds of miles, and they'll allow the propulsion of the storm to move them right in a full circle back to where they need to be. In essence, a seagull uses the power of the storm to their advantage. 
That's the same thing that we see at the cross. You have this storm come in. You have this horrible moment in history of injustice, of accusation, of rejection, of people vying for power and control. And what does God do with that storm? He uses it for our advantage. Because it's in the midst of that horrible storm that Jesus faced with the accusations and the pain and the beating and the cross and the nails and, and, and hanging there. What does he do with that storm? He uses that moment and that opportunity to display the greatest act of love humanity has ever seen as he dies in your place and in mine. It's in the storm that God shows grace. It's in the storm that God uses that hardship to display his mercy, his compassion, his kindness, his humility, his gentleness, and his desire to have a relationship with you and with me. The storm magnifies and amplifies and displays agape love. And that's precisely how we too can react and learn from the seagulls, but more, for, more importantly learn from our Savior that when those storms come in, the relationships are being tested and tried. We could see it as an opportunity to run away, to fight, to flee, to respond the way the world would have us respond and get angry and upset and filled with hatred and discord. Or we could see it as a moment and an opportunity to display the grace of God in the midst of hard times. To give a more realistic picture of this, a relative picture of this, there was a nasty storm that occurred on February 3rd, 1943. During the middle of World War II, American troops were being amassed in England for the ultimate invasion which we would know as D-Day. In 1943, they were moving troops across the North Atlantic in very dangerous waters. One of the ships that was being that was ferrying men uh, over to the British Isle was the USS Dorchester. It left New York in January of 43. It was in the North Atlantic on the night of February 3rd, 1943, when a German U-boat picked up on its location and fired a torpedo into the side of the ship. There was 900 soldiers on board the USS Dorchester on the night of February 3rd, 1943. There was also four chaplains on that ship as well. When the torpedo struck the Dorchester, it began to fill with water. Many people were killed immediately upon impact. There was a lot of men who were wounded uh, below deck. Many of them were trapped. Uh, and these four chaplains, these military chaplains, went into action. They created an entire plan to get the wounded out as quickly as they can to make provision to get those who are trapped up to the top of the deck. The ship was rapidly sinking and they came to the realization they did not have enough life preservers. They didn't even have enough uh, lifeboats. And those who were able to were jumping into the water. They were trying to get them on the boats. And these four chaplains did something very unique. After they helped as many people to get onto the deck as possible as the ship was sinking, they took off their own life vests and they gave them to some soldiers who did not have one. As the ship was sinking and they were helping men into the boats into the water, eyewitness accounts said that they saw the four chaplains arm in arm singing praises to God and praying for the men who were in the water. Gary Clark, a survivor of the USS Dorchester, writes this, as I swam away from the ship, I looked back. The flares had lit everything. The bow came up high and she slid under. But the last thing I saw were the four chaplains praying for the safety of the men. They had done everything they could and I did not see them again. They themselves did not have a chance without their life jackets. That, my friends, is grace in the storm. That's what it looks like. Now if these four men could extend love and mercy and compassion 
in the middle of a horrific disaster, then the God that we serve and who is present in this room and who is working in your heart as a believer, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of the Newport Baptist Church can give us the compassion and the meekness and the kindness and the humility and the gentleness and the ability to interact with people who are prickly, who are mean, who are sometimes hateful. He will give us that grace and the ability to display that grace in the midst of our storms. Why? Because we have a position in Christ. We are called, we are elected, we have been loved. We have a manifestation of Christ that He wants to display. And because of that, when storms strike, we can extend persistent grace. Point number three. When the storms come, extend persistent grace. Let's pray. Father, we...